Hello and welcome to the Known and Never podcast and football show brought to you in association with the Talk Sport Fan Network. I'm your host Natalie Bromley and joining me this week we have a bumper episode. We have our stat man Dave Roberts going to give us a preview in our upcoming game against the Baggies. We've got our FPL expert and analyst Adam Dennett and we are joined by our very special guest and friend of the show Mr Mike Landers. Gentlemen, we have a lot to cover this evening. We have got another fabulous win for Clarence, that home game against Coventry, which we're going to have a look at and, you know, just pull a few things out of that game, which kind of doesn't really have an awful lot of talking points, apart from a very strange fan feud. But we'll come on to that in a moment. And then we will hand over and we will look ahead to the next soon to be championship victory for the mighty Clarence. So before we start, Dave Roberts. In our last preview show, which was, of course, ahead of that commentary fixture, you gave our listeners a quiz question. What was that quiz question, please? Uh, We wanted to know if our listeners could tell us in which year or years did Burnley set the club record sequence of 18 consecutive home wins? That was a very tricky question. Adam Dennett, did you have an answer at all or could you guess? Yes, I did manage to get it after after the recording. That was uh, it was my guess. Um, I'll let Dave come on to um, the answer, but I did manage to get it in the end. Tricky, Mike. One. Would you have had any idea? Because I would literally have been picking a year out of thin air. None whatsoever. <laughs> let's let's go with uh, you because know, I'm picking it out of the out of the ether. What year did we win the uh, the title? Nineteen. Uh, 19- Oh, God, that's even gone out of my head. 1951, 50 51. Excellent. So we've got a 1951, and Adam Dennett thinks he got it. Dave, what was the answer, and did anybody get it right? Uh, the correct answer was I did say year or years. It stretched across two years. It was 1920 to 1921, which coincidentally, or maybe not, was when Burnley won the uh, league title for the first time. So that's, uh, that's when our record run was. And we're not quite there yet. We've got uh, nine consecutive home wins. Um, so we're halfway there. This team can do it. This team's going to be smashing records. Did any of our lovely listeners get a question right, Dave? Uh, the only one I saw in terms of correct answers was uh, Andy Richings again was in touch, got it spot on, 1920 and 1921. And of course, Adam, who also got 1920, 21. Who conveniently got it after he Googled it after the recording had been done. I'm just going to throw that out there, Adam Dennett. We know your trick. We know it. I would have seen. I know we did. Right. Well, let's let's have a quick look before we move on to um, looking at a preview of the show. We have got Mr. Mike Landers on today to talk us through that very impressive um, and I would say hard fought win at home against Coventry City. Now, Mike, before we get on to the actual game itself, a little bit of a weird relationship has developed with the Coventry fans. What on earth is going on, please? Uh, it is It is very strange. It is obviously clearly the most bitter and divisive rivalry in the history of English football, <laughs> which has been kicked off by the, the, the source of all evil in the world right now, which appears to be Twitter. Yes. Yeah, since, since there was the Calibor hair thing... Um, there's just been this really weird rivalry, this weird sort of, uh, you know, hatred, whatever you want to call it, from both sides over something that literally did not happen. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, we didn't buy him. It didn't happen. Nothing happened. And you kept him. Grown... You, yeah. What's going on? Yeah. And from that has grown this this entire thing. And I'm not actually, I'm not going to pick sides uh, because um, ultimately both sides have been as bad as each other. Um, and on Saturday, it was just you. You had, you know, you had the idiot um, uh, uh, doing the minute silence or chanting during the minute silence. To be fair to the commentary fans, I have to point this out: they were the first lot to try and shut him up. Yeah, and they certainly did that. But it, you know, some idiot thought it'd be funny. There has been footage of, of things flying across the divide. Um, I was walking out the ground, and uh, one lad who. Who clearly had, you know, of test his first pint was trying to <laughs> trying to attack everybody. Um, you know, terrible. It's just it's uh, yeah. Let's put it this way. Yeah, it was the way he chose it. It was you know, oh, you know, I'm holding me back. If, if I if only my mates weren't holding me back, uh, I'd be there over kicking <laughs> kicking backsides. And I'm like looking at him going, your mates aren't holding you back, lad. Yeah. Come um, on. <laughs> well, 
yeah, it's just the weirdest thing. And and I, I also want to say, Ian Matt's the man of the match. That seemed to wind up. Really yeah, did. let's come on to that in a minute. Before I do that, yeah. did I see somewhere? And listeners, forgive me, I'm a terrible part-time pro this week. Um, but I was in Austria, so I didn't. I wasn't at the game of the weekend. I had to give it a miss. And I saw a weird headline, and I, I share your view with this, Mike. I never know whether anything I believe on Twitter is real or not anymore. But did I see that Ashley Barnes got pies thrown at him? Or was that made up? It wouldn't surprise me, because at the end of the game, I did notice the subs warm down they normally do their warm down but they normally do their warm down you know a few minutes after everyone's left the pitch yes and yeah. they know you know the stands are empty and they all did their warm down and they all ran straight down to in front of the commentary fans so i'm like something's happened there and i suspect and this is only a guess but it's an educated one obviously the players warm up during the game they run down to that corner and i suspect things were happening uh, when they were doing that, that warm up during the game, so um, I think Ashley Barnes, who has never been one to shy away from all <laughs> things, and Nathan Teller, who certainly he might have a smiley he's face, he's feisty. He definitely, he's he feisty. is feisty. He went down there as well. So um, yeah, let's let's say six and one half a dozen of the other there. I thought that was a bit odd. Um, and I, I think they had a reason. I don't know what the reason was, but I think they had a reason. So Okay, let's leave it at that. Yeah. And we do not condone on the Known and Ever podcast the throwing of any item, be it a pie or otherwise. If you're going to throw a pie, though, don't be wasting a perfectly good pie. That's exactly. Holland's pie is too good, and they're not expensive yeah. enough for the turf anyway. Exactly. Like, let's not do this. So let's move on to then, Mike, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the floor again, just mainly because that's why we brought you on the show. Um. <laughs> Talk us through what many of the media outlets are describing as a below par performance by the Clarets. Interesting to say below par. Was it below par considered, com, uh, compared to the rest of the season? Yeah, it probably was. But that's because the standard has been so high. Yeah. It was not a good performance in the first half. The conditions didn't help. Um, but I have to say, Coventry were much the better side. They were playing some really nice stuff, some really nice pass and move stuff. They weren't creating much in the way of clinical chances, but they certainly were on top. Claret's uh, radar was off. The midfield wasn't doing much. Cork took a very early yellow card, which he justified, by the way, um, which kind of made him ineffective. But Coventry were much, much that better side in that first half. Um, they, they could pass to for a start, which we weren't really doing. Um, our defence was pretty good, I thought. Charlie Taylor in a centre-back, a little bit worried about that before the game against Jokeres. I think he was all right. Uh, Bayer was was excellent. Murich wasn't really troubled, but you kind of got the feeling at half-time that we were lucky not to be going... Sorry, we were lucky to be going in level. Mm. And if we had a second half like that, we would have been very lucky to get away with a point. Um, and I think that's not so much uh, a fault of Burnley as the fact that Coventry, who have been flying, I think, won four out of the last five, something like that. Yeah. Um, they were very good, and you could see why. Okay, so I'm going to bring Adam in just very quickly on this one while we're talking about this. This was a similar theme when we actually played the away leg, Adam, and again, a 1-0, very narrow victory. And we struggled a little bit. Oh, if you remember, that was the one that ended a run of equaliser, of like conceding oh, equalisers yeah. really late on. Um, and I thought their fullbacks particularly caused us a lot of problem at the away leg. What have Coventry given a magic formula that if they could have executed it maybe a little better, that that's how you beat the Clarets? Because that's two legs now where we've not won as convincingly as maybe we have with other sides. Yeah, we've we've seen teams set out for um for a draw against us at, at turf and um and not being anywhere near as successful. Sure. Uh, so credit credit to them for that. I think we played um both wingers right on the to the um right on the touch lines, but we couldn't get them into the game. Um I think the midfield, Coventry won the midfield battle and that just stopped us at source. Um, and going back to what Mike said about Charlie Taylor coming in, 
I think he did okay, but I think we did miss the distribution that Taylor Howard yeah. Bellis gives us. And I don't want to be too critical because it's a new partnership back there. Uh, Taylor and Bay, I don't think they'll have played together uh, before. But I think Taylor, in particular, slowed the game down a lot in the first half mm. uh, and probably didn't give us that quality that, um, that Howard Bellis normally does. But that is being extremely harsh. Um, the yeah, they did very well, Coventry. And like Mike said, I think if they if they were a bit sharper at the front end of the pitch, they got into a lot of positions that really should have troubled us more um, and didn't have a shot on target. So, um, yeah, lucky to go in at halftime, um, nil-nil. I was, I was happy to go in at halftime, nil-nil. I think the only chance we had really were when Coventry gave the ball away in midfield and we brought quite quickly but kind of got in each other's way and then J-Rod sliced a shot horribly wide. Uh, which I think, if, given his lack of chances and, and goals recently, probably snatched it a bit, but yeah. he didn't really put him anything all half. Zaruri and Benson, when they did get the ball, um, didn't look as as confident and, and and as potent as usual. And like again, like Mike said, the conditions maybe played a part, but we just weren't on it at all first half. Okay. Um Mike, it's an interesting quandary, isn't it, that centre-half pairing? Because Taylor Howard Bellis is a massive loss. What do you do if you're Vincent Company in terms of our defensive partners? Do you stick with Taylor or do you bring our new lad in? Difficult to say without seeing the new lad, really. Um, well for this week's game, I'd certainly stay stay with Charlie Taylor. Um, yeah, it, yeah I, I'd stick with Taylor for the moment, unless, unless the new guy has, you know, shows something or is perhaps longer term. Because when Taylor was starting at the start of the season, um, you kind of got the feeling that he was there to to hold the hand of Harwood Bellis. Um, but then Harwood Bellis is just showing how good yeah, he is. Yeah, it's like, no. Um, and he's name. holding the hand of Jordan <laughs> Thayer. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, no, no disrespect to Charlie Taylor, but he's not the future. Um, and no, uh, Bayer no, and, and uh, Harwood Bellis is, and presumably Al Dakil is. So I'd be I, I'd stick with Taylor. He certainly didn't do anything wrong. I yeah. think he's probably better for the West Brom game. And then let's see what the future brings. Um, certainly nothing. He, 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 Adam's right. You know, he doesn't give the. He's not the distribution uh, that Harwood Bellis is. Um, he's never scored for Burnley, has he? He's only scored a penalty or at least two penalties. So, you know, he's 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 good from 12 yards, but not with the long shots. Yeah. Um, I think, did Charlie Taylor score the winning penalty in that cup game that Dyche desperately didn't want us to get through to? And look fuming Newcastle. on the, Yeah, that was it. He was on the sideline like, great, thanks, yeah. Charlie Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And I think he did it against, uh, I want to say, one of the FA Cup games at home. He was like a Barnsley or something. But, um, yeah, I, I'd stick with him. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah. see. Happy with that. Uh, before we move on then to have a look ahead to the next game, any other anything else that you wanted to highlight, Mike? Anything else that you wanted to pick up on in terms of the game itself? Or was it just hard for victory? Well, well, we've got Cork, you know, Cork is out, but JBG oh, came Oh, that's on. very true, actually. Yes. Yeah, oh, JBG, JBG came on and it came, it transformed the team, I thought. Um, you know, if JBG, if we've had this JBG for the last four years, you know, we'd still be in the Premier League. He was brilliant and uh, he makes that glue work, uh, you know, going forwards when we need it to work. And it's a shame that, you know, we can't fit him and that first choice midfield in the team altogether. Yeah. Uh, but he's a hell of a weapon to bring off the bench, especially alongside Teller. Um, the only downside is um, Scott Twine. Uh, the, the lad was literally stripped off and ready to come on. No, uh, he, was standing, he didn't make it he on. Taken, he he had taken his shirt off and everything until that goal went in. And you know, ah! just thinking, whatever that lad has done, he has walked under every ladder. He has <laughs> every black cat. It's a shame. But uh, you know, how do how do you? No one predicted JBG to to fit in no. uh, as well as he has and been, I think, an absolute star this season, um, which is kind of interesting. Because I don't think anyone want, any, not anyone expected it to happen. Um, uh, but I'm glad it did because he really made the team tick in that second half. Uh, Zorori started playing instead of, as Adam saying, just hanging around on the touchline. Um, 
it really began to work and then everything began to click and the Clarets just did the thing that they do, which is just basically throw a blanket over the opposition and tire them out. Um, and when they do it, it's wonderful, wonderful to watch. Yeah, um, it is. It is. And, uh, and just uh, the Mark Robbins, uh, he was criticising his goalkeeper for losing his rag. Yeah. Uh, Justified him so as well, I thought. He was, yeah, I thought he was completely justified yeah. in turning around saying, you don't do that against a team like, like Clarets. No. Because... Uh, it's a, it's a, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a, it's a comparison I hate to make because it sounds lazy uh, with the company thing, but it's like Man City. You cannot afford to stop thinking and concentrating against Man City. They'll kill you the moment you do. And uh, they commentary switched off and we got straight away. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's blooming good to be on the uh, the giving rather than the receiving end it's these days. Amen to that. I'm not going to lie, Mike. I am not looking forward to the end of this season because I'm enjoying it immensely. Um, well, that's, I think, all we're, oh, we're going to cover in terms of the Coventry reaction. Um, let's go ahead now and have a look to the Clarets' next game. The Known and Ever podcast is brought to you in association with the Talk Sport Fan Network. Natalie Bromley is the host and editor, and the show is produced by Matt Moss. Our resident statistician is Dave Roberts, and our FPL expert is Adam Dennett. The analysis show team is collectively Tom Whitaker, Richard Steele, George Poole, Charlotte Rigby, Adam Dennett and Robbie Kopak. Our music is provided by George Gaskill and our newsletter team is headed up by Jamie Smith. If you don't already, you can subscribe to our newsletter by visiting nonadnever.substack.com. Our thanks as ever go to our partners TalkSport. We are as ever proud to be part of the TalkSport fan network.